Is the so this is just some uh, nomenclature, if you will. Um, here's the next couple of propositions. I'll talk to you a little bit through the second one. The first one I'll leave as an exercise uh, completely. Uh, Proposition 8, 4, 14. Uh, if you have a tower of fields, K inside E inside F, then um, this behaves, this inseparable degree, inseparable degree, they behave the way I think you would hope they would. Same thing for scripted I or the subscripted. And I think that you'll find that this is uh, not too difficult to prove. You just kind of really write down what these things are. Um, and the next one, which I'll kind of talk through a little bit, but we'll leave mostly for an exercise, is this. This kind of generalizes uh, some stuff we were doing earlier in Galois theory. So suppose you have an irreducible polynomial over K. So as a polynomial K, this is irreducible. Now, of course, we can find a splitting field uh, for uh, F over K. Uh, yes, I do want this monic. This, this is not so important, but just for my setup. This monic also. Uh, and have a splitting field for this polynomial over K, and let's say U1 is some root of it. Um, so this is kind of cool. Every root of f of x has multiplicity uh, equal to so look at the field k uh, joins with its root u1. Uh, that is a field extension of k. Uh, compute its uh, inseparability degree. That'll give you some integer, one or bigger. Uh, and this will be the multiplicity of every root of f of x, which is kind of cool. So not only is it the multiplicity of root u1, but of all of them. So let me point out that uh, if f is separable over k, then this uh, inseparability degree is one, and you get what you're used to when we talk about the Galois because what you'll have is, is this degree uh, be one, so everything will be one. So in particular, f of x uh,
So f of x must factor like this. U1 up to Un are the distinct roots of f of x. Um, and all of them have the same multiplicity, so they all appear to be the power. And by the way, uh, anybody want to venture a guess as to what uh, U is? You might think about a... Uh, How many roots should this have? The number of roots should be uh, the uh, separability of three. So, in particular, if it's separable, you can get exactly what you think of. All right. And let me throw this one in as a bonus. So if you take U1, and in fact, it doesn't matter if any of the UIs, U2, all the way up to UN, take any of them to this power, it becomes separable, right? That was one of our theorems last time, that if you have a, a general element, tau red, you can take it to a large enough power, it's separable. And of course, in the case that you're used to, uh, where there's no inseparability at all, so this is one, then you get U to the one is separable. So you can kind of get what you expect. Um, why the symmetry? Right? In, in other words, uh, you know, why do these all have to appear to the same multiplicity? Well, there should be an automorphism of the splitting field that takes U1 to any other root you want. U1 goes to UI. Right? And so, if you induce this where U1 goes to UI, basically this polynomial has to be fixed, right? And if this polynomial has to be fixed, that means that all these have to have the same exponent here. So that's that's where that symmetry comes from. Okay, any questions on this? Okay, so now I am going to, and I actually am going to, believe it or not, I can go through some details, and I'm going to do it on uh, this one. This is one of my favorite Theorems. This is called the primitive element theorem. Uh, how many of you have ever heard of the primitive element theorem? This is actually incredibly useful. Uh, in, uh, and, and in fact, when you can sort of generalize this to rings, it's useful in number theory as well. Uh, before I give you the primitive element theorem, Okay. Notice that here, what you have is a field extension that is uh, uh, you've got a, a, a primitive element, right? So uh, this is sort of like a, a a generator. So this is the rational functions in X. Now ask yourself this. Can you find a single element that generates this field over K? Right. And the answer is, is no in this particular situation, right? Because um, you really don't have enough degrees of freedom here, right? Um, notice this is rational functions in two variables, right? So what Z would have to be, with, uh, if, for this to be an equality, Z would have to be a rational function, two variables. 
So this would have to take on the form K P of X, Y. Right, where P is some, uh, well, actually, let me give you, well, let me give you something a little bit more explicit. We'd have to look something like this, where P and Q are polynomials and two variables, and that's Y. Right? Uh, why don't you mess around with this a little bit and see that you can't pick these so that you can get X and Y if you're forced to just have a single a single rational function in X, Y. Right? You don't have problems there. So in general, if you have a field extension, little field inside big field, you don't expect there to be a single element in big field that all you need is little field in that single element to get you big field, right? If I agree with that. But sometimes you get lucky. So this is called primitive element theorem. Uh, let let f over k be a finite extension. Uh, number one, if f is separable over uh, then uh, F is a simple extension. That is to say, F equals K equals Uh, two, and this is actually kind of a bit of a stronger statement. You might ask, when is that a simple extension in a finite case? So, F is a simple extension, if and only if there are only finite and many intermediate extensions. Uh, so, if you can only find a finite and many fields that live between K and F, uh, and, and it's a finite extension, then uh, it has to be uh, simple. Okay. So what I'm going to do, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to sweep everything to the second statement in the following sense. Um, so I'm going to reduce this to just proving the second statement. Uh, note, if F Suppose that we have this condition in the first one. Suppose f is separable over k, uh, and let f of r the normal closure. Let's take the splitting field of polynomials that are split if if necessary. It might already be normal. Uh, Notice that f bar is Galois over k uh, because it's separable and normal. Uh, uh, 
Uh, and so, uh, also over K, the fact that this is a finite extension means it's algebraic. And so F is a finite extension of F, which is finite over K. So F is finite over K, so it's algebraic. It's Galois uh, because it's normal several. Okay, so what that buys us is uh, so there exists only finite and many fields between F bar and K because this extension is a finite Galois extension. Right. And so whatever the Galois group is of uh, F bar over K, well, the number of intermediate fields are exactly equal to the number of uh, subgroups of that in this finite group. So there exists only finite and many fields between F and K, right? Because F is a subfield of, of, of uh, F bar. So uh, this means that if you have a several extension, then you get this business that there's only finite and many intermediate fields. So it suffices to prove uh, number two. How did we get to the last step? From F on large to F normal? Uh, right here? Yeah. Well, so. There's only finite and many fields that live between here and here. So there can only be finite and many fields between here and here. Certainly, if you had inter infinitely many intermediate fields between F and K, you'd have infinitely many between F bar and K. So, um, let's focus then on the second statement because that's going to that's going to be the total windfall for us. Uh, let's suppose first. We suppose first that. There exists only finite and many intermediate fields and of course we want to show that k is at the joint of some unit i want to show that uh, f is a simple extension uh, so, that's given to us. We know that the extension is fine. So, there exists U and F such that So the degree of F over K is finite. And so just go fishing around for all the U's in F and find one such that KU over K is as big as possible, right? Uh, we can certainly do this. And let me point out that if If that actually accidentally equals KU, then we're done, right? Everybody agree with that? Because then it's simple extension. If not, there exists V that lives in F, but not KU. Okay. Um, 
And what I want to now consider is consider all intermediate extension of the form K U plus A lambda, where A is in um, K. So this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to look at uh, K of U plus AB. Now, these are all intermediate extensions because U lives in F and B lives in F. So U plus AB lives in F. So you take K and stick this on. Now, what is our assumption that there's only finitely many of these? Right? So assume, so I'm going to take a little bend in the road here. Actually, we're not even going to need this approach in the finite video case. If K is infinite, there's infinitely many U plus AVs, right? But there's only finitely many of these. Uh, in this case, there exists A equal to B A such that A plus A B is equal to K of U plus B V. Right. Well, so let me play a couple of games here. The first game I'm going to play is let's look at um, A minus B V. This is the same thing as U plus AB minus U plus BB. Um, right? So this is in um, A of U plus A B. Uh, hmm. uh, why is that? Well, because this thing is in here. Because, and this thing is in here because these two fields are equal. Right? So the difference of these two things that live here uh, must be in U plus A B, right? But A minus B is a non-zero element of K, which is contained in K of A plus I'm sorry, in U plus A B. Therefore, B is in K of U plus AB. But of course, if B is in there, then AB is there. So if U Therefore, notice since both U and B are in here, K of U is strictly contained in K of U plus AB. 
because this one has V and this one does not. And this is a contradiction as the degree of K U over K maximum. Therefore, and there's your primitive element there if you've got intermediate. Ah, but we did assume that K is an infinite field, right? Anybody know how to get around this? What if K is finite? Happens in this situation. Well, let me ask you this. <clears throat> Baby step. Uh, if the order of K is finite, what can you say about the order of F? It's also finite because the degree of the extension is finite, right? And so, for example, F is an, I don't know, n dimensional vector space over K. Ooh, I love modules. That means as a module that F is n copies of K, right? It's a direct sum, which is got finite with any L, right? So in this case, F is also fine. Anybody know how that helps? Yeah, it has finite subsets. No, well, we can take the powers of uh, any element of F and we set mouse to this, right? So you're on the right track that time. Well, let me ask you this. Let me ask you something. So if, if I take uh, the finite field F and I strip out zero, then I've got a multiplicative group. And what can I say about that? You might, let's see what it takes like. Uh, see, the homework does do some good, doesn't it, right? <laughs> so in this term, F star is cyclic, right? Therefore, yeah, people can you because <laughs> All you need is that multiplicative generator, K supplies a zero, and you're good to go, right? So in either case, we get um, How about the other direction? Uh, so for the other direction, now suppose that was KU. Why is this the case that there's only? Uh, finite too many intermediate fields. Well, of course, we also know so in particular that element U is house brag, right? It can't be transcendental. Uh, so let's suppose that we have a minimal polynomial. So let F of X and KX be minimal polynomial. Uh, let's make it monic too. All my polynomials go with monic. Uh, okay. okay. Now pick your favorite intermediate field. intermediate field you want. Let me point out that let me point out that this U element that generates F, uh, it's the root of a polynomial over K, which we've recorded here. It's also the root of a polynomial over E, well, you could certainly use that same polynomial, but this one may not be minimal, right? Because F of X may factor down further in E. So we'll say that uh, let G of X equal X to the M
the minimal polygon. Four, U, over. I claimed I claim he is uh, is back. All right. Let me uh, point out that that certainly must be the case because I'm assuming that this polynomial has coefficients in A. So all these AIs are in A. So this uh, this the whole orgy of stuff is contained inside of A. So it's not a problem there. Why does the other containment work? Well, let me point out that the degree. Of F over K uh, M uh, is equal to M, right? Because <laughs> um, notice that U generates F over this bigger field, right? And so, really, what you this is this is actually this field to join with U. So to find this degree, all you need to know is what is the minimal polynomial for you over this field. But I cheated, right? Because I just used the coefficients here. So for sure, the degree of the minimal polynomial is M, right? That means that um, the degree of this extension is M, as is uh, the degree of the extension over E. So the degree, so... One equal to M, which is the degree of F over E, E over K, A zero, A M minus one. And this thing is, of course, also M, because that's the minimal polynomial degree M, right? And so this has to be one, and we need equality. So, what's the upshot of all this? Well, what this means is, so what we should glean from this is every intermediate E is determined. Corresponding P of X, that is minimal poly or U in E. Right. It's determined you need to find that. But each G of X divides f of x, where f of x, let me take you back to the original here, is the minimal polynomial over k for that, uh, and the splitting field average. Well, of course, in the splitting field, this monic polynomial divides down into a finite number of uh, just linear polynomials. There's only finitely many ways to put those together, hence there's only finitely many possibilities. Uh, f of x has but finitely many divisor. So, um, there exists only finitely many Intermediate. Okay. Any questions? Okay. 
So now I've been dying through this coming out stat sheet. Any, any questions on this? Now I'm going to take a little while the rest of today and maybe into some more. I'm going to give you so so now it's time to put away the quill pens and put on your hard maps because I'm going to give you some very practical ways of computing Galois groups. And I'm going to give you some theorems, mostly without proof. I'm going to do some examples. But I'm going to, and in fact, I'm going to culminate this, which philosophically gives me comfort, but it doesn't really do that much good. I am going to give you a way to compute the Galois group of any polynomial over the cube, and actually something a little bit more general than that. And it is a technique you should never use. But you can take uh, solace in the fact that when you die and go to heaven and have very big uh, software up there, then maybe you can kind of do this more or less by hand. But let me let me start off with uh, uh, a policy. So this is a bit of a pop hodgepodge. It's some stuff that uh, I've accumulated over various places, and I've used this myself a number of times. So let me start off with the following proposition. Um, let f of x and k of x be uh, separable well, irreducible uh, and separable. With the green. Hmm. Uh, the splitting field Or f of x over k, then f is Galois uh, and the degree of the extension of f over k this Galois splitting field, uh, if you will, is a degree no more than n factor. Right? Um, remember, we had that theorem earlier about uh, any polynomial has a splitting field degree more than that. Uh, what is more, so I'm going to throw this in as well. Uh, N must divide uh, the order of Galois group. And uh, more than that, uh, This must be um, a transitive subgroup. So, um, most of this is stuff that I've collected. Uh, we know most of the content of this, but I think it's kind of good that we've got this here. Um, here's the one thing that I, I probably should point out. Why should it be a transitive subgroup of SN, right? So if you've got a fifth degree polynomial that's irreducible, say over the rational, so it's separable. Uh, why should it be a trans? S5 has a lot of subgroups, right? Why should it be 
transcript. And the reason is, is if you and the are roots of that place, any two that you then there is this sigma in the Galois group of F over K such that sigma of U is equal to V. And that's why it has to be transitive. So, for example, Professor, hmm? just before you erase it, uh, can we make an upper bound for the, uh, the Galois group from there? Like for, for the order of the Galois group? I think it would be like two to the n, because the gx there has to contain like the uh, some roots of x. Oh, sorry, it's of f. Some of the n roots of, of f. What's n? Is it the degree of uh, the original f of x? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So well, I'm, just, I'm just asking if that gives you like an upper bound for the. Galois group, like, and I think it's two to the end, which is like a... no, because what you're looking is you're looking at subgroups, not the order, right? So every one of these, every one of these divisor polynomials, these g of x's, they determine a subgroup of the Galois group, right? And so that's why you're getting a different number than the end factorial, right? Yes. They're corresponding subgroups, not elements in the Galois group, that's right? Okay, anything else? Can you remind us what transitive means? Right. Uh, so that's that's a great idea. Let's do that. So suppose we have SN. And I think almost everybody's favorite picture of SN is uh, permutation. of the set one, two, three, all the way up here, right? We say uh, let's say H and S N is transitive if for all There exists sigma and H such that sigma I is equal to J. So given any two of these numbers, there's something in that separate. Now, S in itself is transitive, right? Because if I want to take I to J, all I have to do is look at the transposition I to J, right? Uh, the alternating group is also um, the alternating group is also transitive as a transitive subgroup of SN with one exception. Why, why are we just doing I equal J? What's that? Why are we just doing I equal J? Maybe. It's a group having an identity, so. Uh, right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's right. I mean, I could have done that. But of course, it, it doesn't add anything to the proceedings because if I and J are the same, then of course, any does that because. Uh, it just leaves it alone. The identity works, right? So, um, example: let's look at S three. Uh, I can list the subgroups that are here. Uh, I have E. I have E one two. I have E one three. I have E one two three. I have E one two three one three two and I have all of S three. Now S three is transitive as discussed. This one's transitive because this one, for example, takes one to two. This one takes two to three, so I've got that covered. 
uh, this takes three and one, so I've got that covered. Now, what do I not have covered? I need one goes to three, okay, and three goes to two. So any, anything's covered here, right? Uh, these groups are all intransitive, right? This one, uh, there's no way to take the element one to three, uh, and for that matter, two to three, right? This one you can't take uh, one to two, for example. Yes? We have a relation between the orders of the transitive group and the essence. Well, so let me uh, let me kind of go through here. <laughs> so, So I think, well, I, I, I don't want to speak out of turn on this. So for example, so for any of these transitive subgroups, there may be more than one, but it's it's up to isomorphism. Uh, S2 is the only transitive subgroup of S2, right? Uh, but that's silly. But actually, this is kind of nice because this is one of the reasons the Gal or the quadratic case is so good. S3 is there's only two subgroups here. Namely these two. We have them listed. What are the transitive subgroups of S4? By the way, with any end, you're going to get that pair, right? The cyclic group of order four, generated by one, two, three, four, right? That takes one to two. If you square that, it takes one to three. If you cube it, it takes one to four, and you can go through this exercise with all of them. And of course, anything that contains a four cycle will work. So in particular, um, D4, which I apologize, I don't think that's Macaulay's notation, but I, I do it on the dihedral on the square. Right? And there's one more. It's Z2, Z2, but there's only one of them. There are other Z2, Z2s that live inside of S4. Here's one of them. This one is not transitive because there's no way to take one to three in that list of them. This one's really kind of cool because it is, even though it's isomorphic to these, right, then, um, but this one is, is uh, this one's transitive. Uh, these two subgroups uh, shouldn't be conjugate either, uh, right? Because, um, let me see, that's 1.4. Yeah, the eight groups are transitive. The, the, these actually shouldn't be conjugate because, um, if I recall right, in SN, two, two elements are conjugate if and only if they have the same cycle type. And none of these have the cycle type, just a single transposition. The conjugate of a transitive is also a transitive? What's in that? The conjugate of a transitive subgroup is also a transitive? Yeah, a conjugate should be, yeah. Uh, I, uh, I, I think that's right. That sounds right to me. So um, I'll give you a list for S5. We'll talk about this uh, more on Friday. By the way, uh, on Friday in the math club, uh, Jared uh, is going to give a very interesting talk about math, like from the roots, the philosophy of math, how universal is it. It should be, to you all in here, it should be. Great interest. So I encourage y'all for that. Other than that, y'all have a good one, and we will see you on Friday.